Uh, first, I would like to uh, just say thank you for uh, coming here on a Saturday. I know Saturdays are precious, weekends are precious, so I appreciate everybody here. Um, and I also uh, would want to, uh, um, my, my name is Doug Fagley. I am the Director of Environmental Health at the Public Health Department for Madison Bend County. Uh, and with me today is Jeff Lafferty. He's our ev Environmental Epidemiologist with the uh, Public Health Department. I do want to recognize and acknowledge everybody in the room. I super appreciate um, the, our elected officials and our state partners here. Um, I think if I could, we have Christy Baumel from the mayor's office over here. Um, we have supervisors Rusk and Riff back here at this table. Uh, Supervisor Alder Rummel, sorry. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, our our partners are represented here with uh, Sarah Yang from DHS. Oh, jeez, thank you. I, it's, because you're, it's because you're new. <laughs> I am sorry, apologies. Uh, Alder Foster here as well. Um, and then uh, Jim Amarine from the uh, DNR, uh, the fish consumption specialist. So we're pleased to have, have him here as well. Um, so the, the scope of the meeting today is we're going to talk about surface water results and we're going to talk about fish tissue and the fish advisory. I know that there's probably a lot of questions and concerns about remediation and cleanup and everything like that. We're not going to touch on those in this meeting, but I do want to let you know that there is a, uh, a, a, a organization or a group of us that are working together to provide a larger meeting that will be uh, entail a lot more people uh, we're thinking around mid-March, we're hoping uh, for that, and that would have all of our partner agencies, DNR, DHS, uh, Public Health Medicine, Dane County, uh, uh, the Air National Guard, um, uh, city and county officials that would be at this meeting. So um, just uh, keep a lookout for that. That will go into more detail about the, uh, the remediation plan. So um, if you're here for that, uh, stay along. This is still going to be a good presentation. So. Um, I do also want to recognize uh, Marisol uh, is here for Spanish interpretations, and Pau is here for Hmong interpretation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should recognize uh, former secretary. Thank you. So these are the important messages that we want to get out to everybody today, um, and, and uh, that we can carry with us uh, today as we go out and talk to people in the community. The uh, PFAS stands for per and polychlorinated alkali substances. Uh, we'll use that acronym a lot. I will also use PFOS a lot, P-F-O-S, um, because that is the basis for our fish consumption advisory. The PFAS chemicals stay in the body for a long time. It takes uh, several years for them to, to work their way out of our body once they are in there. There's a variety of health risks that are affiliated with uh, PFAS substances, um, and we'll talk about that, um, especially in high levels. And what we're talking about and what we're here for today is the high levels that have been found in our fish species in Starkweather and in Lake Winona. Lake Winona. I just said Lake Winona. Lake Winona. Um, and then really the, the, the primary message is that we got to look at our fish consumption and uh, ensure that we're following the uh, guidelines that have been set by the DMR. <laughs> so we'll try to answer some of these key questions. Uh, what are PFAS chemicals? Uh, how do they enter the body? Um, why the consumption is uh, being restricted? Why it's different here than, than elsewhere in the state? And then we'll touch briefly on surface water and foam. So uh, per and polyfluorinated alkali substances are um, as, uh, substances that uh, were started being produced in the 1940s. Um, there are over 4,000 compounds, um, and there can be more and more growing all the time. It just depends on the chemical structure. Um, the peak production was from 1970 to 2002, um, and then they stopped using them um, uh, both uh, the two PFOA, PFOS, uh, was discontinued in uh, 2015. The, uh, uh, they're commercially useful. They're very good at, at the job that they do, and that's why they've been used so much in a lot of our products that we see and use every day. 
Um, they're very good at um, putting out fires. Uh, they form a barrier and just starve that fire, and the fire is out in a matter of seconds. They also have a lot of great uh, oil grease and uh, uh, stain resistant capabilities, again, which makes them very useful because uh, cleaning um, or repellency from water, different things like that, is, uh, is great uh, for products like uh, Gore Tex jackets or anything. And again, there's over 4,000 types of, of compounds, and there can be more uh, as time goes on. Which is one of the one of the issues that uh, we often hear about is that there are we don't know anything about we know we we know something about two of these compounds really extensively PFOA and PFOS the other three thousand nine hundred and ninety eight plus we don't know too much about at all um, because they haven't been studied um, like the two uh, PFOA and PFOS um, hopefully. Um, they will uh, be studied here in the, uh, in the future, especially with all the press and um, everybody starting to realize the, the PFAS uh, uh, problem and issues that we have with it right now. So some of uh, the, the, the <coughs> compounds don't break down in the environment. They're resistant to break down. They'll, they'll enter our, our groundwater and they'll enter our, our surface water and eventually they'll enter our fish, which we'll be talking about today. Um, they're commonly called the forever chemicals because they don't break down. They don't go anywhere. They're, they're in our environment and we need to um, uh, be removing them to proactively to get, get rid of them and, and discontinue the use of them as well. They're found at a lot of uh, training sites, uh, uh, military sites, uh, airports. Um, they're also found in some of the manufacturing, uh, 3M uh, in Minnesota. There was a lot of PFAS from around uh, their manufacturing. Um, as well as uh, Wolverine, uh, a boot manufacturer in um, Michigan, where high levels of PFAS have been found because of the Scotch guarding and different materials that they use on boots to, uh, to keep the water uh, repellent. Um, and another uh, important environmental concern is that the PFAS does um, bioaccumulate in fish and in wildlife, and that's one of the things we'll be uh, talking about here in just a moment. So PFAS does have health impacts, um, and uh, we don't we don't want to be consuming PFAS, uh, and we did, we want to uh, you know ensure that if there are high levels of PFAS um, that we are avoiding the ingestion of the uh, PFAS and, and avoiding health impacts. Um, high levels can uh, increase the risk of thyroid disease, uh, increase your cholesterol levels. It can reduce the efficacy of uh, vaccines um, and decrease the fertility in, in women as well. Again, and I'll say it again, this is based, uh, all these studies are based primarily on two different compounds. There's not a lot of work on compounds other than PFOA or PFOS. So um, there is a lot of unknown um, out there in regards to these chemicals. This is something that I just hope that we can all uh, leave just thinking about this as, uh, and when we look at uh, risk and we look at contamination, we look at uh, primary three routes of, of exposure, either ingestion or eating it, inhalation it, or breathing it, or dermal, it's uh, being, uh, going through our skin and our ability of our skin. The primary route with PFAS is ingestion. So we just think about ingestion uh, as being um, where most of our PFAS are coming from, from either like the packaging of the food that we're eating, uh, there could be PFAS in there as we eat the food, then we're taking in some PFAS <coughs> as we eat the food. Uh, what we're talking about here today is the fish um, and the uh, amount of PFAS that are in the fish and then if the fish are eating, and we're ingesting that as well. Um, ingestion of dust or soil. Soil around areas of uh, high industry and manufacturing uh, would have high levels of PFAS and somehow if we're getting that soil uh, into us, again, we're ingesting it, or the dust that's around that soil. Um, also dust in your home, that could be a breakdown product, it could be a scotch guarded uh, materials in your home uh, or on your um, couches or your, your uh, carpeting, that breaks down and becomes dust uh, and then you are ingesting it. 
So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we have PFAS, most likely, uh, I would say everyone in this room has PFAS in their blood um, because uh, of the wide use of it throughout the, the globe and, and throughout the world that we've all ingested some and we will have a certain level um, in us. So, today, we specifically want to zero in and talk about the Special Fish Consumption Advisory that uh, has been put out by the Department of Natural Resources for uh, Lake Monona and Starkweather Creek. So I kind of wanted to step through the tissue results here so you have some idea how it was done. Um, on the left-hand side are the different PFAS uh, substances that were tested for. And across the top um, are the species that were tested. So if you can see, this is Starkweather Creek. You have largemouth bass, uh, northern pike, walleye, and yellow perch. The other thing I want you to notice is that this is in parts per billion. When we're talking about PFAS in water, we talk about it in parts per trillion. So the results that you see here, if you want to make them the same as what we see, for instance, the Department of Natural Resources and Department of Health have put out a recommendation of 20 parts per trillion in groundwater. So keep that in mind too. Groundwater is different than surface water, is different than fish, but just use that as kind of a guide uh, when you see some of these numbers. So PFO, PFOS is the one, the, the one PFAS that accumulates in fish uh, the best, actually. Um, other ones are reduced pretty quickly. So this is kind of the, the one that's used for the fish consumption advisory, um, used by the Great Lakes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so that's the one that we should concentrate on, those numbers up on top there. Parts per billion, if you want to make it into parts per trillion, add three zeros at the end of each one of those numbers to give you some idea. So we are talking some fairly significantly high levels in fish. Um, these are the rest of the uh, compounds that were found. ND means non-detect, so they weren't, uh, there was no PFAS detected um, in some of them. And then at the bottom is, is the total of the, the PFAS, um, of all of them. So again, um, there's some discussion on looking at individual compounds or looking at the total. Um, but we'll find and see that the total does fit into the consumer advisory uh, uh, as well uh, in regards to the Great Lakes <coughs> Consortium. And uh, you might want to point out that we did test for all 36 of the compounds that we've been testing for in water, and these were the only ones we found detectable in the fish. So the other uh, roughly 30 other compounds were not detectable in the fish. Thank you, Jim. Did everyone hear that? No. that okay. These were the only ones that were found. 36 different substances were tested in the fish, and the, uh, the ones listed here on the left were the only ones that were, were found in the fish. Thank you, Jim. So this is Starkweather Creek. I'm going to show you the same thing for the Again, Lake Monona, parts per billion. Please keep that in mind. Again, PFOS uh, for this. This is our bluegills up here, and then largemouth bass on the, on the right. Oh, some of the numbers? Sure. Sure. Um, absolutely. So uh, the, the PFAS for the bluegill, uh, there's one here at eight. Uh, so if we think about it as parts per trillion, that's 8,000. Um, over here on the far right, there's largemouth bass, which is 110, which would be 110,000 parts per trillion. Um, the other bluegill, there's 48, 48, 30, 46, 43. So you can see we're probably right around the, the 40s uh, for bluegill if we average it out. I do have a slide later that will show it averaged out and put it up there. Um, that will make it a little easier to understand some of this. Yes? I'm confused. Um, so 110 parts per trillion is within the standard that you said that 
parts per trillion is the standard for groundwater. Okay? So we are talking fish tissue here. Right, so but you're ingesting the fish tissue, you're not pretty much ingesting groundwater. Are you talking to It's actually sure. So I'm the groundwater taxonomist for the state. So um, I think Doug was doing that just so you could see kind of comparison of um, where the health risk you know we're concerned about. So the numbers are, are calculated very differently. So when we're giving fish tissue advice, we're looking at how much fish could you eat every day and be be safe, be under a level where we think that might you know cause too much PFAS to accumulate in your body. Um, so these aren't based on a standard. It's based on taking that amount of fish, like how many meals could you eat a month, and make sure that you're staying under um, a level that we think would impact human health. Okay. Okay. So, that's what we'll get. Yeah, we'll get to oh, that. Yeah, the groundwater standard is set a little bit differently because we're saying here's how much can you groundwater to protect your house. So we can't directly compare these numbers to each other. We can't compare the groundwater standard to the fish tissue concentration. And I think that, that was confusing for me to say that, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea to compare, you know, the standard that in groundwater and then some of the numbers up here, which are, are much higher, to give you just some perspective of what we're talking about with the fish tissue. Yes. It, it does. Yes. Um, I was wondering if um, what kind of ratio we have in these fish from the water level to the bioaccumulated fish level. The numbers here. First question, and second was was this testing um, just the just the uh, the meat of the fish, the, the 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 part of the fish that you eat, or was it testing the whole fish? So, yeah, I'd like to know how this be, relates to the ground Let me just go through the rest of the presentation. And oh, if some of the good questions. If some of those questions are answered, then fine. If not, then talk to me. Um, some of your questions may be uh, answered by um, some of the um, some of the slides, but also some of the people in the, in the audience here that um, may be able to help explain some of that. So, um, the link to the results is right here. Uh, hopefully, this presentation will be in a place where that, that link will be active so that you can um, check it out and um, look at all the results that the DNR has put up on the uh, website. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about why, uh, why we set the advisory or why the DNR set the advisory where it's at. So there's a uh, organization called the Great Lakes Consortium for Fish Consumption Advisory. It's a uh, group of the states that surround the Great Lakes as well as uh, Canadian provinces as well. Um, and they work together uh, to ensure that the message is the same across. They're compiling, compiling all of their studies, all their research, um, and have landed at the chart up here as being the best, um, the best uh, practice for uh, fish consumption advisories. So again, I'm going to switch back from parts per trillion to parts per billion. Okay, so keep in mind, so that the tissue samples that you saw, the, the results that were there, will fit in between the 20 to 50 parts per billion or the 50 to 200 parts per billion. Once you go over 200 parts per billion, that's where the advisory is to not eat the fish at all. Um, so if you look at the bluegill that we saw in the earlier slides, they went from 8 to 43 parts per billion. Put it right up there, one meal per week. The perch, the largemouth bass, northern walleye, they went from 8 to 180 parts per billion on those previous charts. So that puts it in one meal per month. Um, they're looking at uh, various studies to ensure that they're uh, where they want to be in accordance with the research that's been done. Um, there's a lot of studies. To answer your question, Lance, there's no reduction given with PFAS when it comes to uh, a safety factor um, or figuring out uh, what can be eaten and what can't be. PCBs, you do get a reduction if you cut the belly fat from the fish um, and don't eat that you're reducing your exposure to PCBs by 30 to 50 percent. That's not the case with, with PFAS. Um, it's, uh, you, there is no way that you can uh, take the fish and, and clean it in a way to reduce the amount of PFAS that you are consuming. Yep. 
what's a meal? A meal is on the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing too is that the Great Lakes Consortium takes, takes into account the fact that eating fish is good for us. Um, it's high in uh, omega threes um, and other uh, substances that are healthy. So um, that's taken into account um, when these decisions are made um, about the fish consumption advisory. All right, not the next slide, it's the next slide. <laughs> so here is all of that put into <coughs> one slide. We have the guidelines on the horizontal lines, unrestricted, one meal a week, one meal a month, and do not eat. So that's the guide on the, on the left hand side. Across the bottom are the species, as well as the average results for each species. So you can see clearly that bluegill is uh, right in between here, one meal a week. All other species are above that threshold of one meal a month. Um, so just this is all, uh, all of it. I'm <coughs> uh, it, it can get a little confusing and everything, but really what it comes down to and what we want people to uh, take away uh, from this is Limit your fish consumption of bluegill to one meal a week. Any other species, one meal a month. Um, some other species that weren't tested still are at a separate fish advisory, and that can be really confusing. So just uh, if you just think of one meal for bluegill a week, uh, one meal for other species a month. And a meal is eight ounces for the Great Lakes uh, Consortium. There are other studies that they have that are based on four ounces, um, but a lot of times they're saying more meals per week to four ounces. No fish fry. Right. <laughs> and I think, I think Wisconsin's guidelines are generally like, um, for all of the fish fryers in Wisconsin, I think it's generally based on that eight ounce meal. Yeah, so. Uh, oh, I think that in general, the fish advisors in Wisconsin are based on a meal big eight ounces. So that would apply to like certain other people, but also like, you know, PC advisors. Um, I just want to show this quickly. So if we, yes. Okay, a question oh, connected to the fish consumption. Yes. So to my understanding, PFAS accumulates. Yes. Um, so if I remember correctly, the PFAS is like um, it has to be like one meal a week, right? Yeah. Like how do you That's you know, where, right, they're looking at that. This is over a lifetime. If you're going this to go over, over a once a week over a lifetime, that you wouldn't have accumulation to a point where it's mm -hmm. going to cause a health impact. But based on the numbers that we have now. Correct. Okay, thank right. you. And, they, and, and remember again, it's based on the PFOS, which is the highest, <laughs> highest numbers up there. Right. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the substance that we're being so, exposed so to. So the assumption is, I think, one of those things that are going to be. Yes. Within the whatever. Yes. Type of yes. Okay. Thank you. And still being safe. Maria? Yeah. Can you, um, so, and you didn't develop advisories for sensitive groups. Um, and, I, and I know looking at other states, and we've gone through this too, that states like New Jersey have um, said that any fish with over 17 parts per million, which would be all of these fish, sensitive groups like women, pregnant women, and children, should not eat at all. Can you explain um, how this is protected for a sensitive groups or what, what, the, what the thinking was of that? It might be something else like Sarah or something. Could you explain Sarah, Sarah or Jim? I don't think yeah, Sarah. So, so I think, um, so can you repeat the question? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So your question is that some other states have set different um, recommendations for sensitive populations. So like for these means, there's different recommendations for women um, or children. Um, so she's asking why we didn't that for um, so there's a couple different things. So right now the, the data isn't suggesting that there's a, a group that's any more sensitive than, than other groups. Um, when we come 
to how much we have to change or to everything. So, um, you know, we were looking at the data, there might be some slight differences between effects on men and women, but it wasn't enough to say, like, oh, when we should eat this many less fish than a, than a man. It would be, like, really not a significant difference in advice. Um, and the other part is, um, you know, there are benefits to eating fish, and so we have to consider that when we're telling people, you know, when we're saying this advice. Um, we're supposed to be passed every day from a variety of sources, so we have to take that into consideration um, when we study these health advice. These are not, you know, forever going to be the health advice. We, we're constantly learning more about PCAS. We're constantly learning more about how they affect our health, but also like the benefits of eating fish. So, you know, do those benefits of eating fish outweigh the, the health effects? We're learning more about that. And so, DHS and DNR have committed to continuing to look at this information and update these things as we learn more. So this is kind of like that first step to, to, to take to try to protect ourselves. Um, again, I, I, you know, we just have to go back. We don't have a lot of uh, studies on a lot of these different uh, substances, and, and as we get more studies on uh, things, you know, it can change. It probably will change. Um, this is just, uh, I, if you go on the DNR website and you check the fish advisory online, it's going to look like this, uh, which does still kind of separate the groups, but actually it is saying the exact same thing. Um, it's just, uh, it looks a little bit different. It's saying, you know, one meal per week for bluegill, one meal per month for other species. Now, is the muskies up there isn't from the PCBs then? Uh, so yeah. Do not eat, do not eat uh, Probably mercury, actually. Mercury and PFOS. So the, it's more uh, mercury based. Jim, would that be? Yeah, musky. Oh, so it says yeah. do not eat musky. Yeah. Correct for the women and kids. Yeah. Correct. But that's that's still, based on mercury. Because they have just the most, right? Yes. The most. And the highest level predator, so they accumulate the most mercury. All right. Any other questions on fish tissues or anything? I have a question about, like, for example, these fish are going to buy them in the store or the ones that they get from the lake? Because when you have one, they can get from the lake and eat it, they don't know what kind of fish is. How would they figure that out? Um, what? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that you can see some of the current fish advisory guidelines that are out there, the science that were produced in, uh, in uh, collaboration with the uh, Midwest Environmental Justice Organization. Those signs actually have pictures of each of the species. Um, and I'll show that here later. Um, the other thing is, too, is that as a, as a fisher person, you should know somewhat uh, uh, the species that you're, you're collecting. Um, because if you do eat, like too many blue or not, I should say blue, let's say you have, um, I don't know what that is, there's there's limits of what you can conduct. So you do have to have some knowledge what they are, but then we do have some signs that we actually show. Um, actually, the DNR has uh, pictures. In fact, I think if you look on the back of your sheets, there is a, uh, a picture of the uh, fish advisory of the species on there. Oh, it's on that poster over there, too. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, I can't even explain it. But, um, you just got to get um, athletic of PFOS in memories and in the repairs. Uh, no, not, uh, not specifically. Um, but there, I, I, we did talk about the PFAS are forever chemicals and they stay in our bodies for quite, quite right. some time. <coughs> So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Two One is uh, maybe at the end of the presentation, but are what are the plans for uh, do you testing for the cars? Yeah, we're going to keep it. We'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other one was um, probably not easy to produce off the cuff, but it's the question about parts per billion in the fish, parts per billion in the water. Um, it would be helpful, perhaps, to have an equivalency both for understanding the fish side but also the water side. Like how many glass, eight ounce glasses of water will you drink to have the same amount in an eight ounce of, you know, for example, 
that is that something that can be proved or is that not possible? So, so I guess the way we put it around here and the way the, the amount of fish in your data are set is based on
or studying more research as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, have you talked to the New Jersey taxologists? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can yeah. say, we'll just keep going here. We can, uh, if you have any questions, we can uh, discuss them after the presentation. So I want to be respectful of people's time. For me. So we're just going to talk uh, quickly about the uh, surface water results. Again, the one the message that I really want to make clear is that in order to uh, be exposed to PFAS, you have to ingest PFAS, right? So the main message here is that surface water, don't ingest the surface water. Uh, it's as simple as that. And I think that we um, are, are taught that when we go swimming and everything. Don't drink the pool water, don't drink the lake water. It really comes down to just don't ingest uh, the water. So the surface water samples, oh, this is terrible. Thank you, sorry. We are um, kind of right over here. I'm reading this right. Yeah, you're right above the nine. Yeah. Or, right I'm sorry, just to, the, just to the right of the nine. Right. So just to give you some perspective, we're right about in here. The airport's right here. Um, there were 20 surface water samples that were taken. You can see 14, uh, 13, 12 are all kind of at six, are all kind of north of the, uh, the airport. And then uh, samples along Starkweather Creek, and then surface water samples into Lake Monona. All right, now we're switching to that Clark Petroleum. I think uh, when I uh, revise this, uh, the, it's going to be in one. I'll, I'll just use one across the uh, across the whole thing, either uh, trillion or billion. So, um, so these are. I just have one question for you. Will the state that you have? Many of us have gone through this, but the fire re fire departments that were used in the airport have both the octanoic acid and the octanoic um, sulfate one. Is that true? The I mean, what chemicals? I, I don't know uh, for sure exactly yeah, some of the information that would be needed. So we're not again. I'm not talking about. I, mean, I don't know where the source is from. I mean, we don't know, um, you know, exactly what what's going on. So just uh, given the surface water samples of these two compounds, PFOA, PFOS, um, and you can see this is parts per trillion. Uh, so some of these are uh, fairly significant. Um, as you can see, and on this next slide, because uh, people want to know where 10 is, here's 10. Right there, that's the airport. That's Starkweather Creek coming right in here, and then from here down to Lake Monona. That's where the highest level of the surface water contamination was found. So this is the current signage that is out there right now. It's temporary and it will be changed. It was put up on a temporary basis until we get uh, the results back from the fish tissue, uh, which we have back now. So the signs will change um, and they will um, be put up along 34 different uh, access points along Starkweather Creek. We will also be putting it at the launch, uh, at Obrecht, both of the launches there. We'll probably hopefully try to get something over by Monona Terrace. Uh, there's a lot of fishing along that uh, bike path there. We'll get some notice uh, over at Olin. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, that uh, you know access the lake there. We'll try to get some notices in the uh, beaches around Lake Monona um, in uh, the city of Monona as well, so that uh, we are advising um, people um, that there are PFAS in the water. And that uh, use caution. Are you finding people in the Are you can see that as the same? I know, we, we, we can. No, absolutely, it's the same. Yeah, 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 there's definitely, there's nothing there now for signage, so we would put some signage there. Do we know anything about the fish in the downstream lakes yet? Uh, not yet. Not okay. We'll talk about that in just a second. And do you know how soon the signs are going to be replaced? Okay. Do you know how soon the signs are going to be replaced? Uh, I don't at this point in time, Brenda. We are waiting on approval from, we have to get approval from uh, several different people on the wording and language that is appropriate. And then once we get that done, that's just a matter of uh, a week or two. Uh, we send it to our sign shop, 
they print the signs up, um, and then the city of Madison Engineering will go and then put all the signs up. The stakes are already there. We don't have to worry about freezing or anything like that. It's just a matter of, of getting them uh, approved and uh, printed up. Now. Uh, just talk briefly about foam. Uh, the foam, uh, if, if it is looking more like a PFAS contaminated foam, it'll have a bright uh, white coloring. The PFAS concentrates in the foam, and it can reach levels of, uh, uh, that are quite high, uh, what we would determine as really high levels. And so the best advice is just don't touch it. Don't play. I, know, I, I know I was a kid at one point in time and made myself a foam beard and things like that. It, it's just really best, regardless if it's PFAS or naturally occurring, not to be touching the foam because it could be uh, have other contaminants than PFAS or bacteria or other things in there. So it's just best to leave it alone. Will the signs say that? Yes, the signs at this point in time will say that. Yeah, good. Yeah, I was hoping that they would. Thank you. So is that the prices where the foam accumulates and then I'll say it dissolves or melts or whatever it does when it stops being foam? That ground is pretty much more contaminated because it's concentrated from the foam. You know, we don't know that yet, but that's uh, something that has been brought up. And I know that there is some places where uh, there may be foam residual, it just be a matter of testing it. But it's going to be in the water. If it dissolves in the water, it will be. So the signs we put around those areas too, because you know, people blame the mud. Um, yeah, Jim, do you want to address that? Um, the thing you got to remember about foam is that it has a very high surface area compared to its actual weight. So even though we're seeing in the 80,000 parts per trillion in the foam, uh, the actual mass of PFAS in that foam is actually very little. So because it, 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 it's like uh, if you take a, a piece of popcorn and you throw it in the water, it, it, it all of a sudden gets really small. That's, that's kind of how foam is too. So it's it's, it's probably a hard concept for people to understand, but um, that 80,000 parts per trillion is in a very, very small part once you, once you dry that, that piece of foam out. So there's actually not much PFAS there. It's just very concentrated in that, in that, in that piece of foam. So like once it goes back into the lake, it's going to you know, mix back in, and like the lake itself would have you know, yeah. much lower Put the first more to a kid, a little kid, a dog, swipe their kid, swipe their hand in it, wipe it on their mouth. They might get a pretty good dose that way. I think I mean, that's kids play with we don't want them to get that obviously, right. but you have to remember there's lots of things in foam. Yeah. There's high phosphorus in foam, there's bacteria in foam, there's lots of things. So it's kind of like the uh the algae uh with, when we when we talk about that. And we say to people, you know, that water looks yucky. You probably don't want to go in it. You don't want to swim in it. You won't, don't want your dog exposed to it. It's the same thing with foam. You know, it's just a general, there's lots of things in that stuff. Yeah. Probably I don't know if that's a general idea. Most people think foam is, foam is nasty in the, previously. But that's why we want to, I mean, that's why we want to afford it. Yeah. I'm and glad it's going to be on the side. Yeah. And from a key health risk, I mean, bacteria and foam is more significant. <laughs> could make you sick tomorrow versus like again you're adding to that daily exposure of PFAS you're getting by like you know accidentally getting some PFAS in the mouth like so either way we don't want anyone you know getting exposed to things that they don't you know need to be exposed to. So is the sign specifically going to say avoid all homes?
You want to reduce it by adhering to the uh, fish consumer advisory on bluegill meal per week, one meal of other species per month. We want to make sure that we're uh, dusting and evacuating surfaces at home on a regular basis, collect that feed pass, and get it out of our home. Uh, limit eating food from uh, uh, packaged products, which is so hard um, because we don't want to have that big, big bag leaking on our clothes as we're driving down the, the, the road or anything. But um, that and just making sure that, you know, somehow we're letting our voices be heard to these uh, manufacturers of these products that we don't want to keep us in our, in our products. So, uh, showering, dishes, swimming. Uh, should increase exposure again. You're not ingesting it, and it's not a very good uh, dermal uh, uh, cross your dermal layer very well. So I just want to talk uh, briefly about some next steps. There's a lot of movement in this area as it's becoming increasingly um, <coughs> out in the public. There's been a lot of uh, media attention on uh, PFAS. So um, right now, the DNR is planning additional sampling. Who asked that question, but they are doing some additional fish sampling and surface water sampling. Um, and, and I think I've heard uh, Lake Lumbra, <coughs> Brittingham. Yeah, we're going to uh, basically test fish from all of the acid lakes this upcoming year, in addition to additional species from Lake Monona. So we're going to try and collect as many species from Lake Monona as we can, as well as the other acid lakes that have most tested. And we are going to be doing surface water sampling from the Haro River, Lake Mendota, Six Mile, Pheasant Branch, any of those tributaries that come into Lake Mendota. We'll be doing uh, Lake Mendota again, Lake Wingrass, Wingrass Creek, as well as the Mount Creek Lakes of Madison Chain. All of the fish samples are from the, the analytical samples are from extracts from whole body homogenous. They are from lakes. Thank you. Jim, what about waterfall? Uh, they don't stay in one place. There's, uh, you know, a lot of waterfall that use all the same waters. Right. And then, as you know, uh, late in the day, they fly away, they fly out into the surrounding uh, cornfields and stuff and feed, and that's where waterfall hunters are. We don't know where they spent the majority of their life and what they ingested. Puddle ducks, you know how they eat. They eat diver ducks, same thing. But if they they uh, take a little flight and uh, head out by uh, uh, say the Deansville Marsh or, or north of town, and those of us that are sitting there in the cornfield shoot ducks and geese that live 90% of their time in these creeks and lakes, are they going to be doing more testing? Uh, so the question is, what about ducks? What about waterfowl yeah. that people might potentially hunt and, and eat? Uh, quick answer is we don't know yet. Um, I don't know. I, I'd love to be the cautiously optimistic person and say Starkweather Creek and Lake Monona is the hot spot for this stuff, and that you know everything else is going to be great. I can't say that right now, but that's what we find out. Yeah. Um, how much time ducks spend? Specifically in Starkweather Creek and Lake Monona and then fly off to other space and other places we can't say. So I Sarah, do you know if anyone has proposed doing anything on waterfall? I've heard DNR I've heard the wildlife program talk about adding PFAS to their to their list. To their list. I don't know if that's been confirmed or not yet. Um, and I mean so you know we so there's the DR waterfall link program, which Jim said, but there's also the wildlife program. Do we think that that's an exposure pathway? Can we assume Lake Mendota is probably going to have lower levels? The question was, can we assume Lake Mendota has lower levels? Uh, and I would say I wouldn't assume anything at this time. Maria? Can I just point out I've said this too many times, but I will say it again that following the question about wildlife, um, in order to understand risks to wildlife, and home fish are of the research, a lot of it um, tend to have a lot higher levels of PFAS because the PFOS has been built up in 
um, organs and <coughs> and secondly on the human health front, which I know I've said many times before, some people from different cultures eat more than the boy in different contexts. They put whole fish in soups. Um, and so other states have been doing filet uh, and whole fish and I'm hoping at some point in the future you can do something more than just filets. In order to understand health risks to everyone, not just people who eat only filets and also to wildlife eating. Thank you, Maria. Thanks. It's hard to have a question. Is, is there a way for a person to get tested of how much your body burden is? Uh, I'm sure that you can go to your doctor and have to do it. I'm sure you're asked. Are you saying that in your service? I want to know how much people, you know, I, I've been in the creek a million times doing my, my monitoring and stuff. I didn't know to shower afterward for the last seven years that I've been there every month. And um, I'm just concerned how much I have because the symptoms I'm having right now are identical to the symptoms of the PFAS. And I'm just wondering if there's a way for me to get tested for my body burden. So there are labs that could do that. It's several hundred dollars. And again, it's not going to tell you that PFAS is responsible for that. I'm very familiar with toxicologists that have done new drug identification on 
I just suspect that I am not familiar with my reading of the Democracy literature, that there has been any published, either Roman or other mammalian toxicology study. The reason why this would be important is one would know what is the acute organ, hematological, and other specific toxicities that are the first to show up. There's no understanding here, and I have no understanding, and you need over 50 plus papers now as to what that really toxicology is, so that people can be aware that they are ingesting too much in that perspective. I think that's a very important consideration that has to be brought to the surface here. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, there is a, there's a, a ton of information we don't know. Very great uh, uh, information that we could. I mean, maybe that's all there was. I just have to move on. I was going to be reading the Yes. Um, since we know that it's hard to treat and late normal are all the way at a high contamination level, I'm really concerned about the compression plan for two X scale, which is going to release a lot more U.S. contamination, which has been shown to be there in the start of the treat. So it is my understanding that uh, construction would have to follow a normal process and that there would have to be testing and uh, uh, cleanup uh, taken before the uh, There's no limit set. Specifically, 
um, go beyond the scope of the fish consumption or surface water that we're talking about today. That will start talking at uh, remediation, the future, uh, what's going to happen at that point in time. We're looking right now at mid March uh, for something like that. Um, and hopefully, we can uh, get the right people there that could answer some of those questions that you have. So, we are. Uh, I think that's part of the construction process is actually evaluating the, the soil that you're deserting and where the construction is going on. So, um, yeah, uh, just kind of reflecting back on our question about the and the Fishing clubs in Madison that have private 
Facebook pages, and there's been oodles of extensive discussion. And on the ice, there's lots of discussion. I know I've been part of it. There's, I mean, there's a lot of that going on. One of the things that I've thought about doing is actually going shanty to shanty with a flyer to, to talk to the uh, ice fishers that, that uh, you know, there's uh, PFAS in the water. Right so, yeah, right now. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the feedback. I'll do a better job. So thank you.